Okay, so uh, here's what we were. Can you hear me? Okay, so here's what we were um, this Tuesday and uh, we went through how to determine the uh, MEM WB hazard and the EX MEM hazard or to utilize the forwarding to mix to avoid this and how to create the, the determination criteria for them. Okay. And uh, I received some of the feedback uh, from students and asked me to go for more details of the pipeline because they didn't have the background before in the undergraduate uh, undergraduate career. And so I give you some of the example here. You, you see my screen here? See this the new slide here? Okay. So you can see that. So actually this is the slide for the course I taught before for the undergraduate level computer architecture course. And uh, I will also so you may already notice that I share some similar slides on the Sakai. Uh, about the MIPS assembly codes and because that's that part of the knowledge also. Uh, uh, belong to the scope of the undergraduate undergrad level computer architecture. Okay. And for some of the Pipeline details, so I will reshare here, and I will again. I will also post the this uh, this slide on the on the Sakai after our class. Okay, so this is especially for those students who do not uh, know the pipeline details. So I, I hope that to give you an example, and I this example can also help you to understand those the pipeline registers. Okay. So here's an example, and uh, again, so we have the, the five instructions, and the, all these instructions we use the, the mix the MIPS ISA, and uh, so you can see these five instructions. So each one they have the address, address. So this is the five instructions, and uh, each instruction have its address. This address is represented in the decimal format. And uh, also we have some assumptions here. So for each register, so in the MIPS the register, their name is the, by the number. So for each register, they are first initial, initial to contain the value is its number plus 1000. For example, register eight, we assume that it contains the value one, Sorry, 100, 108. And for each data entry in the memory, we assume that it contains the value of the 99. Okay. And so now let's see what happened. Okay. So this is, uh, I will show you what happened side by cycle. So this kind of cycle level uh, illustration. So at the beginning, so this is for the AF from IF stage, right? So we, at the beginning, we fetch the first instruction, LW instruction from your instruction memory. 
to fetch that, right? And we know that we have a program counter here. And uh, so you program counter, we are at the beginning to store the 1000 address for instruction memory, because your initial, the first instruction is address is 1000. Send this address to the instruction memory and instruction memory will send out, will read this first instruction out to the pipeline registers, right? And your, your PC will be updated by full to read to the second instruction in the next cycle, right? They're clear? So if you're unclear, I will explain again. So any questions for this, for the cycle one? No questions? Okay. So this is for cycle one. So at this moment, the information of your First instruction right now at the end of cycle one, they are stored here in this pipeline register, IFID. And uh, second cycle, for your instruction memory, it begin to read the second instruction, right? And uh, at the same time, you're in your ID stage, instruction decoding stage. So the register file will begin to use because the IFID pipeline register it store the instruction it store the information for the first instruction and then it will send it. Those information contains what contains this value register number eight register twenty nine and offset four. All of these values will be parsed. Web analysis and they send to the pipeline registers. Like the 29 will be sent here, the eight will be sent here, the four will be sent here. And after sending this, for example, 29, we know that we need to read these registers and it will be 129 because the value is the 129 based on our assumption. So is, is everything clear here? Any questions? So, so notice that, so for some other ports, actually we don't care or that we don't know because based on the instruction format, we have the three general format, R type, I type, and the J type. The I, LW, so that is kind of the uh, I type. So for some format, for some ports here, actually, do we, they, we don't have the information there. Okay. And then for those, the details, the R type, I type, should have, so you can check the slides that I post on the Sakai. For the MIPS assembly codes. And then for the third instruction, at the third cycle, so, Instruction memory begin to read out the third instruction, and your ID stage begin to read the second instruction, right? Your, at the end of second clock cycles, your information of second instruction is stored in the IFID pipeline register, and then in the third cycle, the information will be read out from the IFID register to the and begin to send to the register file, and because the I because the SUB instruction. So this is an R type instruction. So the register name four, register name five will be sent here, and the result will be out will be read out here. And the th these two they are the source source registers, and the two here is the destination register. Source register is IS and the RT represented. 
the destination is RD. But remember that in the detection of the, the hazard, we have the RS, RT, and RD. So four, five, that's RS, two is the RD. Okay, and there will be, the results will be sent here. We read from the register file here. This is for the second instruction. And for the first, now information is being processed here. We processed here. So we know that, so 29, register 29 is information, is its contain value is 129, right? 129, at the end of the clock cycle two, it is stored in the ID exe pipeline register. And then in the third clock cycle, it will be read out from pipeline register sent to the ALU, right? And for the four, this is the offset, it will also be sent to the ALU. ALU will calculate them together. We'll add them together, get the 133. Because 133, that is the address of our memory, data memory's entry, what we want. This is the base address, this is the offset address. Right? Okay. And RS, RT, and RS, RD, RT informations are stored in the pipeline register RDXE. At that moment, and it will be read out as, as well. Any questions? If you have any questions, just uh, unmute yourself and let me know. No questions? Okay, and then the clock cycle four. So the MEM stage begin to process the first in, uh, first instruction, and then you can see the IF stage begin to process the, the fourth instruction. Right? So right now we have the, the four instructions right now, they are simultaneously processed in our data pass. And you can see that for the first instruction, address 133 will be used to read the data memory and then get its entry 99, right? And you can see for the second instruction right now in the EX stage, so 104 and 105, they will be calculated and the result will be the negative one. Right? Okay, so what I want to express in this, in this example is that to let you know that, so, Actually, those the information, instructions information, actually they will be stored in this ID, EXE, EXM, EM, those the pipeline registers. How the information flows here. And then clock cycle five, so then the first instruction will be finished for its processing. The result will be go back to to update the register file and so on. You can see the first, the fifth instruction, the last instruction will be read out from your instruction memory. And then the clock cycle six. So right now, clock cycle, clock cycle five, so right now the, your entire pipeline is full and then for the clock cycle six, actually your first stage, IF stage it begins to empty. So right now we don't uh, read any new instructions from your instruction memory. Okay. And then clock cycle seven, your ID stage becomes idle. And then clock cycle eight, EX stage becomes idle. Clock cycle nine, MEM stage becomes idle because right now only one instruction is left 
in your data pass. And then after clock cycle nine, so we finish the the pipeline processing of the five instructions. <coughs> so, any questions? Do you need me to explain again? No questions? Okay. Then I will go back to the So can you see my screen? Okay. So go back to our uh, slides. Previous slide. So actually, so here you can see that. So after the instruction memory, we fed the information of the instruction from instruction memory. So R T R D I S. So actually that means that like, that is the information. Number two, number three, number one, those information, they will be, you can locate them, identify them from your instruction memory, uh, from your pipeline registers. Okay. And they will be continued to passed for the next stage because we may use that. And in the forwarding unit here, you can see that we will use, we will exam, we will exam the RT information, IS information, RD information here. And here, this RD information, that is the destination register of the, the previous instruction, right? And, RT, and here, this RT, and here, this RTIS, that is the instruction, that is the uh, register name, the source register name of the, the next instruction. So using this way, using this information, actually we can examine whether the adjacent instructions, whether there exists some the, the dependency or not. Right, so here this one, this is the RD of the, the instruction of ADD. And this is the RT or the, R, or the RS for the instruction of, of the second ADD instruction, right? We need to, because one criterion to detect whether we have the, the dependence or not is to, to check whether the register name is the same or not, right? So here we can, using those information stored in your pipeline registers, check that, right? And then using those the criteria, that. Notice that the rack right actually that is the control signals. So for those control signals, they will also be stored. So in this figure, um, the control signals they are be uh, ignored here, but actually those the control signals will be also will be also stored and passed to these pipeline registers. And finally, your forwarding unit will, will 
generate the forwarding signals to determine whether we will forward or not. <coughs> Any questions? So, so notice that here, uh, uh, this is kind of the very detailed description uh, description for those the forwarding. So, uh, because I hope that it can give you a better understanding so how it works at the kind of the micro architecture level. So, so this part will not be tested in your uh, like in your quiz or in your homework, but I hope that you can understand that. So, especially if you if you plan to uh, like to develop or design or implement those the pipeline uh, processor for your final project. So then you can. Include those those the detection and uh, the dependency detection and uh, resolving mechanism in your design. If you want to do that type of project, so you can reach me, and then we can discuss more details about that. So, any questions? Uh, next, so uh, this this Tuesday and uh, just uh, now we we just finish uh, we just go through the first approach to handle the the flow dependency and now let's take a look at the second one and uh, the first one is kind of the more kind of the active way because we want to forward and bypass the data to do that. And the second one is kind of more passive way. So sometimes we just wait. We just wait. Because dependency is this kind of the, the issue on the along the, the time step. So then we can wait until the this problem it disappeared. So this kind of I call it kind of more passive way, and uh, th why we, we sometimes we need to wait because uh, forwarding sometimes they cannot solve anything. Forwarding solution, and here's example. So our first instruction is that the load instruction. That means that we want to load the information from the memory to a register, right? And your second instruction is the, the end instruction. Okay. And here we know that that dependency existed between these two instructions at the for the register number two. And uh, more specifically, so because this is a load instructions, actually, so we need to get the address, calculate the correct address of your memory entry. You want to load the data at the end of the clock cycle three. And the clock cycle three, and then begin the clock cycle four. We will access your data memory, and then get your data. Get your data, and then so that means at the end of clock cycle four, you can get the data you want to uh, write to the register number two. So at the end of clock cycle five, you officially write those data to the register number two. So that means, so at the earliest time, so you can have the information 
those are the value you want to write to the register number two at the end of clock cycle four. That's the earliest moment that you can have that. But for the second instructions, actually at the beginning of clock cycle four, you already need that, right? At the beginning of clock cycle four, you already need that information for the operation of the end operation during the clock cycle four. So in that case, that means that so the forwarding cannot solve this problem because physically the data is not available. No matter data is in the register file or some or be calculated. So at the end of class four, the data just be calculated, not be just just appear from at the output end of your memory. So this is kind of true that hazard that so the forwarding cannot solve. Any questions for this? For this example? No questions? Okay. So in this case, so we can use the store. We can use stored uh, solutions. So just as the name reveals a store, that means we just uh, store the pipeline. And more specifically, we delay the second end instruction. Right? So we continue to let the First, the load, instru load instructions continues. And then after the clock cycle four, so the data is available here. And then since we store the second instruction, so we can, it can be wait for extra cycles. And then it will need the new data of the register number two it, at the beginning of clock cycle five. And in that case, then we can use the forwarding to forward the data to the input end of your, your ALU. So that is the key idea. Any questions? Sometimes we also call that this delay. We can call that we insert a bubble here. So the bubble here. 
And the note is that a very important thing is that when you store the one instructions, actually you have to store all the following instructions. So for example, in here, when you store the second instruction and instructions, so for the third instruction, you also need to store, you cannot just store the second one. You cannot do that. This is because if you only store the second one and do not store this, the following one, so it is very likely that you will introduce the, the, some new dependency or the new the data hazard there. Because right now we already changed the timing step for one instruction. And then to make sure that we don't have the, some the similar problem happening, so we need to delay all the following instructions. Okay. Any questions? Any questions? You can see that the store it is kind of the much should be much easier to understand and to be understood as compared to the forwarding, right? Okay. And uh, so actually, the store operation can also be interpreted using another way. So it is equivalent to actually we insert a empty so called no 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 operation instructions. So in many cases, so we interpret it in that way. So we insert previously you have the three instructions, right? Actually, since you want to store these two for one cycle, actually you can view that in the pipeline format we introduce the empty instruction. And in that case, you can have the group delayed for all the following instructions. Any questions? So th note that this is just not type of interpretation. This is to to make it kind of the format consistent in the pipeline style, and the to and the in fact is kind of equivalent. Actually, so that is uh, for the microarchitecture level. So that is what we can do to implement to to implement the store. That is, you can we can we can generate an uh, empty instructions or to let, just to let the many control signals begin to. Set in the disable style, and then to make the store happens. And for example, so all of those that the uh, uh, many control signals. So we have many control signals for the those that the functional units. Those control signals will be set to zero. 
and to to make sure that no actions, no arithmetic actions, no read write actions happen. Then we can realize the storing effect. Any questions? Okay, so notice that for the store, so this is, first of all, this is a very general solution. So in principle, so store can, can, can resolve many different types of the dependence on the hazard. But in practice, typically we hope that we can have some other solutions. The store, actually, that is your, in my case, it's the last solution. It's the last choice because the store, very obviously, so it will cause the, the more latency. Right? The entire pipeline have to be stopped. So this is kind of very useful solution, but it's also kind of the sometimes costly, expensive solution. So that's a reason if we can have the forwarding work, and then we will use the forwarding. We will not directly use the store. Because once the forward, if the forwarding cannot solve things, then we can consider using the store. Any questions? Okay, and the the last one. So for the for the dependency, so actually we can another handle solutions. We can predict the needed values. Sometimes we can guess that, we can guess that. And so those will be covered in the lecture nine, so in the, during the control hazard. We will revisit uh, in the following lectures. So this is about, a, about the flow dependency. And then, so we have another two type of the dependency, the anti-dependency and the output dependency respond to the right after read and the right after write. Okay. And uh, for these two, so essentially, so they actually, they're not true data dependency. And in many cases, they are kind of the, because of name, the register name, and not about the true logically, we have some data dependency there. And so for this type of the, Dependency actually, we will have a general solution that is so called a register renaming. Register renaming. This is because the, for the output and the dependency, so the same registers refer to the values have nothing to do with each other. Actually, the essentially the reason is because we lack of the, the registers names or the register IDs in your ISA. ISA can only provide the limited number of the registers. Like in the MIPS, you only have the 32 registers, register names. And uh, one general solution, we can rename the, the register ID. Okay. And um, more specifically, so we can find, we need to find method to allow more register names. And uh, so then we can eliminate those dependency. 
to re by renaming those to the destination registers. Maybe you think it's kind of the many very abstract. So let's take a look at this very simple example. Okay. So here we have the five instructions. Right. And for example, the F6 in the second instruction, this is we need to write that, right? And for the F6 in the fifth instruction, we also need to write that. Right? And for the for the F6 in the third instruction, we need to read that. So this is a read. So this is a, a moment. Yeah, we need to read that. Okay. And here, so we can, this is example two for the reg register renaming actually. We can rename the like Fx, F6 to the S, F8 to the T, rename them. Rename them. And after that, you can find that. So F6 previously in the second instruction, it is the, the we need to write that. And F6 in the fifth instruction, we also need to write that. Right? And now the destination register, the name becomes different. So then we can avoid the Output dependency here. Right? All right. Okay. But how to achieve such a renaming? How to realize that? Because this is just kind of the at like at the comp or kind of more soft level, software level, so we know that we want to do such things. But how to achieve this in fact? That is what will be covered in the, our next lectures. Any questions? Okay, so let's take a look at screen. You see my screen? So then we will enter the lecture eight, the out of order execution. So as I mentioned just now, so for the register renaming, so how to achieve that? So this will also be covered in this lecture because for the out of order execution, during the introduction, you will see that. So uh, this technique or this Process scheme will also use the register name, renaming. And then you will see that. So, how we achieve that at the lower level. Okay. So, for this lecture, I have not posted the slides on Sakai. After, after this lecture, I will post that. And, uh, and especially, so this lecture is. I will post the is the uh, is the raw PowerPoint files on the Sakai because as you will see later or in the next class. So so this out of order execution is kind of a bit complicated. 
and then we use some of the animation to describe in the detail, give a very detailed example. So then when you review that or revisit it by yourself, so you you can use those the PowerPoint files to revisit those the entire the, the animation process for this. So, so this is the position of this lectures in the part two of this course. So, so out of order execution. So essentially, actually, out of out of order execution also it targets to solve the problems, the issues when we perform the pipeline. But uh, typically, we want to specifically to. Um, to include another category because this is a very kind of the, the complex scheme, and uh, we want to emphasize the, this role here. And also notice that it's out of order execution. So, so this is a very key part in the model in the modern processor design. And uh, so, what we will Describe here is kind of general, very maybe you think it's kind of already become complicated, but it's still kind of the e easy solutions that in the industry. So, so actually, if you take a look at those the new features for Intel, AMD's, the for the ARMs, the the new product, sometimes they they will mention that so. So how about the out of order execution performance? So this is a very important optimization technique to improve your processor's performance. And then so many, many uh, engineers and the computer architecture scientists uh, so work on many different ways to improve this. So here for this introduction level course, we just uh, uh, described some of the, the general idea. <clears throat> Okay, again, so the big picture is still on the processor design here. <coughs> Excuse me. Now let's first recall our common processor stage. Okay, so here you wanted to simplify our example because I will give example. I think maybe in the next le next class. So, so recall that we have the five stage for the pipeline. Processor, right? Instruction fetch, instruction decode, execution, and uh, uh, access the data memory, and then the write to register, right? Register write. And here, so when we when we do not consider about the, the data memory. We do like, like to we do not read to the data memory and so on. So, and uh, we just simplify that as a four stages: batch, decode, execute, or the retirement. Four stages. So this is want to simplify our implementation. So fetch instruction, access a register file to decode the detailed information of the register of your instructions and to get the value of your of your uh, your source registers contains and so on and then perform the execution your semantic operations like the end the add the subtraction and so on and then retire like to read back uh, and to write results and something like that write back and so on flush the pipeline and so on so, so about the flash pipeline that we will discuss in the lecture nine about the control hazard. In that case, we can simplify to the four general stages. Okay, so note that here is the relationship between the five stage pipeline. Okay, so notice that so for this the stages here. 
Okay. So this is the ideal case. Each state just contains the one clock cycle. This is the ideal case. Right? But notice that in practice, so especially for the execution stage, not all the instructions they have the, the same amount of time. Or, or they just need a one clock cycle. What about that? And the simple example that for the like for the very simple arithmetic operation, like add subtraction. Yes, yeah, so we just the one clock cycle for the execution stage. ALU is not enough. But to notice that. So in the model, I say so actually we have some of the more complicated arithmetic operations, like the, the multiplication. MUL or the division DIL DIV. So if you want to multiply or divide something, actually, though the instruction you just the one use the one line instruction, but for the execution time, it will be much more costly. And especially for the if you want to divide something. And also, if you want to multiply something, so the you can view that mathematically multiplication can be viewed as kind of the accumulation of the, the multiple results of the, the addition, right? So in principle, the multiplication that requires the more clock cycle than the addition. Is that right? So if you already took my VSI design course before, so we you, you may remember that. So when we want to implement a multiplier, so the one way is that so you can interpret the multiplication as kind of the shift and addition operation, right? So you will go through the several rounds of the additions and shift your intermediate results and then get the final product of your multiplication. So all of this uh, take time. Right? Okay, so determine no, not all the instructions take the same amount of time. Some instructions, they need uh, the They needed uh, more times, especially for the execution time. Any questions? Okay. So, so one naive solution. So actually we can keep all the operation, all the instructions at the same time. So to make sure that your pipeline is kind of the very consistent, right? We like something like this. But obviously, so this will cause the longer latency. Right? So this is kind of very naive solution. And more important thing, what is worse that what happened? If your first or your early instructions is kind of the very time consuming, and uh, your full instruction also have some of the dependency for that.
So think about this way. So your first instruction is the multiplication. And the, the result will be stored in your R3. And your second instruction is R3. Second instruction, one of its source is required data is the, from R3. And since your multiplication, it requires many cycles to execute that. So that means that in a naive way, so we have to, when we begin to work on the first instructions, the second instruction, we have to wait, right? But wait for the second instruction. It should have to store because, because the R3 has not been, new R3 has not been available yet, right? And since it's stored, as we just learned from the previous lecture, once one instruction is stored, all the full instructions have been stored. That means all the, the from the instruction two to the instruction four, all of these full instructions have been stored. Till the R3 in the first instruction has to be calculated. So that is kind of unfair to the third to five instructions, right? Because for the third, for this one, this one, this one, these three instructions, actually, they don't have any data dependency for the first and the second one. Right? They are independent. But because your second instruction is stored, so all of these three have to store as well. Right? So obviously, it's kind of a waste of time. We don't want to do that. It's unfair for them. Is that right? But following the traditional pipeline design strategy, we have to store them. Right? Just as we learned from the lecture seven. So this is a very big challenge. A big issue raised by the pipeline. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, so how to solve this? So I think maybe you already have some rough thought. So remember that since these three instructions actually they don't have the dependency with these two. So you may already think of that. So why we cannot change the processing order? Do not wait, do not be stored by the second one. Right? We do not follow, we do not necessarily follow the previous strategy. The, all everything's in order. Right? Actually, the solution is so-called out of order OO execution. And the key idea is that we move the dependent instruction out of the way of those independent ones. We can make sure that independent ones can be executed. And in this example, that means that yes, you are when since your first instruction multiplication, you need to you need more use the more cycles to execute. That's fine. 
you continue. And since your ADD instructions, the second one, you need to wait till the R3, the results come out. Okay, that's fine, you can wait, but don't block the way of the, the following three instructions, right? Since we don't depend on you, your result, so let's letters to be executed as soon as possible. So that is a very natural idea, right? That that is actually that is the key philosophy of the out of order execution. Move the, the dependent instruction out of the way of those independent ones. So then we can fully utilize the, the resource. And to achieve this, or to realize this idea, so there are several key points that we need to be very careful. First, so right now you want to move the, those dependent uh, instructions out of the way. So you need to create some the areas to, to let them have a rest, let them to wait that till their desired results, their desired like value, like the R3 result can come out. So actually, you have some so-called reservation stations. And also notice that, so you need to monitor the source values that are those that are dependent instructions in the reservation stations. That means that you need to wait, you need to monitor, watch the status of the R3 when, once it can be, it's new value has been available. You need to notify the second instruction right now. It's okay for you to begin your work. You don't need to wait anymore, right? So you need to monitor those are the source values. So when the source values are available, like when your R3 is available, available here, R3 in the first instructions have been calculated. That means that, okay, so right now it's time for the, let, let's to resume the ADD instruction, right? To file, dispatch that instruction. So when we want to achieve this out of all execution, that is the thing that we need to be taken care of, to take in to be taken into account in our plan, right? <clears throat> so essentially, you can see this kind of dynamic scheduling. The schedule become complicated, not like the, the straightforward pipeline. You just wait, you just store, and then and still keep a very simple scheme, scheduling. So for this one, out of order, so the schedule become more complicated. And that is the, the challenge of heart, how to resolve that. And this is a one examples. In order and out of order executions. So we will go to the details in the next lecture. So uh, you can see that, especially for this algorithm. So look if you want press very detailed uh, go through for that box, the clockwise ones, because this is a very complicated procedure. So we may use that, uh, more than one lectures to go through those, those steps. You can see this is a bit complicated. So I, I will I will post this 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 the PowerPoint slides on the Sakai, so you can first to review that by yourself. You can see this is. This this is kind of uh, uh, a little bit complicated, but uh, the key idea is still something here.
the key idea is just to monitor the values and make sure that the, the source values when it's available, you can dispatch previously the stored instructions. And this is how the, some more details about that, the general principles. We will go look into those details in next class. So that's end of today's class. So, and uh, see you next Tuesday and uh, have a great weekend. And uh, Okay. That's the end of today's class.